looking at the lights and I'm smiling and I'm waving at people. And that's why I cycle. And I don't like to sit in the car and be stressed out behind the wheels of not moving traffic. So that's why I cycle. And I've met lots of interesting people over the years. And I love when people come up to me and say, I see you on your bike. I see you on your bike. <laughs> yes, you do, because that's me on my bicycle. Please don't try to kill me. I'm very flattered to be asked to chair a meeting. I've never chaired a meeting before. The most uh, amount of chairing I do is Christmas dinner, and I don't get any respect at that time. So I'm <laughs> delighted to be asked to uh, chair here, and I'm really excited to be introducing some really interesting people. That's the other great thing about being a cyclist. You get to meet interesting people. You don't get to meet anybody when you're stuck in your car. So we'll be started straight off then. You've heard enough from me because I, once I start talking, I never stop. So we'll hear instead from Joan O'Connell from the Dublin Sand Cycling Campaign Executive side of her day job in data protection. Joan's interests are cats, bikes, and human rights. Which order is that in now? <laughs> Do we have cats on bikes have human rights too? Okay, um, I'm delighted to be introducing Joan and looking forward to hearing from her. Great. So I'll uh, fire ahead if that's okay with everybody. Uh, first up on, on today's list. So um, as promised, I'll try to be as quick as possible. Um, I'll just share my screen if I can. Um, and please let me know everybody if you can't see that or if there's any difficulty. Okay. I'll also switch off my video so I don't distract people with my face. Okay. So uh, yeah, so as, as uh, introduced there, my name is Joan O'Connell. Um, I'm on the, the Dublin City, uh, Dublin, cycling campaign, I should say, uh, executive committee, and I'm involved in other, other different aspects around sort of cycling and so on. So I'm going to do a very quick uh, high level breeze throughout the reasons why, why I cycle. Um, so if I start out, first of all, uh, why, I, why I started or restarted cycling. Um, basically, once upon a time, there was a bus strike. Uh, so back in 2016, I think it was, uh, there was a bus strike and where I worked was um, somewhere very awkward to get to. So this is what my usual route would have been involving the bus. So it was eight, eight over eight kilometers to work. Uh, so there was a big long round the house's bus journey down to the south side uh, from where I live. Uh, and then there was also on top of that, or that includes uh, one and a half kilometers of walking, which I was never a fan of anyway. And it usually took me at least an hour, but more, that, more often than not between an hour and two hours to get to work. So it was absolutely agonizing uh, commute. Um, so then when the bus strike happened, I dusted down my bike that I used to cycle as a teenager and realized to my delight, and it was quite a revelation, that my journey to work was seven kilometers. I shaved over a, a kilometer off my commute. Uh, there was no walking, which is great news for me. And on average, I, be, I could be guaranteed it was 30 minutes or less to get to work. So this was magnificent. Uh, and I was really, just, I kind of, at the time, I think I realized or ask myself, why hadn't I been cycling all this time? I'd wasted so much time commuting and getting stuck in traffic, even with bus lanes, um, you know, the, the, the bottlenecks in town really were an absolute pain. So it was fabulous to sort of figure out or to realize that actually cycling was an option and that it was much more convenient. I think my perception up until then would, had, would have been that it wasn't really convenient uh, to cycle. Even though I had cycled as a kid, I'd kind of given it up in my teenage years, like a lot of teenage girls, and I think the Anshu Cycles research has some of the, the findings to show that as well. Um, and it's still the case now. Um, so I rediscovered that. Uh, this was, uh, as I said, 2016. So it's a number of years ago. And since then, uh, pretty much I've been cycling um, more or less the whole time, um, except for uh, there was sort of an instant where I had to re restart cycling. Uh, so I was commuting to work uh, in December a number of years ago and somebody in their car turned across my path and put me in hospital essentially. Um, so I hadn't even made it two kilometers down the road to work. Um, this was in Christchurch. Uh, so I had the um, help and support of the Dublin Fire Brigade, the ambulance service, the people in St. James's Emergency Department. And uh, this really could have put me off um, uh, cycling altogether. There was surgery involved, there was rehab involved, uh, physiotherapy involved. And quite a lot of sort of like shock and trauma to go with that. Um, but I actually didn't want to give up cycling. I didn't want to have that put me off. So I kind of, as part of my recovery, um, 
Ironically enough, the physiotherapist said cycling would help um, because it was a low impact type of exercise. So it's actually practically it was useful. So I kind of sort of forced the issue with myself to say, look, if it's medically advised, I'll, I'll get back on the bike. And it also helped. I had problems with my balance after the crash as well. And your bicycle, I didn't realize this, your bicycle compensates for some balance issues. And in my case, it was able to compensate. So it was actually a physiotherapy uh, tool for me as well to get back on the bike. So that helped me kind of overcome maybe a reticence around getting back on the bike as well. So it was quite a, a traumatic experience and one of the things that kind of kept me going and, and the physiotherapist as well in my rehab and recovery were, were really great. But one of these quotes, um, one of the things that kept me going was this quote from Martin Luther King from a completely different context, a completely different struggle. But for me personally as well, it was something that really I kind of returned to again and again, this quote from Martin Luther King. Um, and it was a quote obviously about, it was an address he gave to high school children and motivate, motivating them at the time in the civil rights movement and in the 60s in America to, to keep going in life regardless of what's thrown against you. So this was his quote. One of the things he said in this uh, high school speech to students was, if you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl, but by all means, keep moving. And I think for me, this meant a lot because it was it was literally true because this was part of my physiotherapy, but metaphorically it was true as well, as well as tapping into the, the interests that I have more generally around human rights and civil liberties and so on as well. So it really kind of seemed to bring everything together at that time. So I really kind of returned to that quote a lot. And that was one of the things that kind of motivated me to get back cycling after that incident. So then why do I keep cy cycling now and why do I kind of make it a big, a big issue? So apart from obviously that personal uh, major incident that occurred, um, at the moment, I'm involved then in a lot of um, groups. So there's the Dublin Cycling Campaign. There's also Monthly Cycles, which is a, a women's uh, cycling group that myself and a number of others, uh, of others uh, founded a number of years ago. And we've been going for a couple of years on and off through the pandemic, but we've managed to kind of keep it ticking over. And we had our second Monthly Cycles birthday yesterday. So uh, that's us there yesterday celebrating. Uh, and we had a few goodie bags and, and nice kind of cakes and things for people who showed up. So this is one of the things that kind of like really kind of get, gets me and um, keeps me involved and keeps me cycling because it's such a positive experience. And it's as uh, you do meet amazing people, whether it's purely by chance or through organizations or meetups or social events, you really make meet some f fantastic people. Uh, this is a Pride Bike Bop, which is the Pride cycle that happened this year because there was no Dublin Pride. So I was involved in that with um, a number of people from iBike Dublin. And I think a few people maybe from Dublin Cy uh, Cycling Campaign, I think as well, showed up. So again, this is just a, a great fun experience that we had. We cycled through the city centre of Dublin and it was fantastic just to be able to do that with people. I'm also involved locally in there's a, a Dublin 8 school cycle bus and I think there's a number of people here who'll be talking about their experiences um, and you know sort of the issue around Dublin 8 or the issue around cycling cycle buses is quite topical especially now in bike week but in general to make sure that children have a, a safe route to school and the, the kind of the contradictory thing around cycle buses is while it's great fun and you can kind of escort the kids to school and see their see their enjoyment of it it really isn't something that should be needed as well. It's, it's a kind of an indictment or a, a, it tells on the, the lack of infrastructure that children have to be escorted to school, that they can't go safely. So that while it's fun, there's also kind of a, an important aspect around it uh, in, in terms of ensuring safety for people who cycle, no matter their age or no matter their ability. Sorry, Joan, I'll have to get you to wrap up there shortly. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Okay, I'll, I'll skip through the last few slides. Um, so basically, those are some of my motivations. Uh, so it is, as Joanna said, hugely joyful. Uh, the safety aspect uh, from my own personal experience and wider experiences is something that really is, is central to making sure that people can cycle. Equality is a ma massive issue because the public realm and, and so on is not a neutral um, entity or a neutral space. There are gendered and racialized aspects to it as well. So that's really part of my motivation. And I want to try in, in the work that I do be as inclusive as possible to make cycling something that as many people as possible can participate in. So that's partly as well why I cycle. So that's it. These are all my little uh, links. Uh, we can put them up later on if you want. Uh, so on social media, I'm available on Clicky here. And then also these are some of the groups that I'm involved with as well. So I'll leave it up there. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for running over, Siobhan. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. And I'll say thank you, Joan. Always interesting to talk to Joan. Thank you again.
some great slides there. I really liked your um, graphic, particularly going from work on a bus. I haven't been on a bus since I'd say about 1991. I that hate the okay. bus. I hate the bus. Absolutely hate the bus. It's a terrible thing to say. I don't like them. Um, did I mention that? And I probably, I walked rather than bus and always on my bike. And my friends used to say, they pass me on the bus on my bike and wonder, how did I beat them? Because the bike is lost on the bus. Certainly around Dublin it is anyway. Absolutely. So I'm not going to start talking again because I won't stop. Martin Quinn is up next. Dublin Cycling Campaign Local Rep for the Dublin Midwest, Dundalk and Lucan area. So we'll silence myself, <coughs> Martin, and like to chat away for three minutes. Okay. Hi, everybody. Can you can hear me? Yeah. Yeah, my chosen subject is the 15 minutes uh, city. It's uh, for work, education, shopping, health, leisure, uh, all done via bike or walking. And the reason why I choose this subject, I'm very lucky uh, living in Luke and South that all the off-road uh, cycling infrastructure was built at the same time as the houses. So I live the life, I live 80% of my time within the 15 minutes and it's all off-road safe cycling. So I can get to the mall, I can get to the shopping centres, I can get to the a Grand Canal, I can do everything off-road and within 15 minutes. So it just, I'm just going to talk with some of the benefits and my perception of what works and what doesn't work. Um, so it was developed by a guy called Carlos Marino in Paris who, who does, had, had this daily, or had this, all your daily needs is done within 15 minutes by uh, foot or on bike. Now human beings, it's in their DNA since we settled down and, and started farming and then lived in cities. Most people lived 15 minute lifestyle but we've lost our way so now it's coming back with intent so and the whole emphasis the whole it boils down to one thing cutting down on unnecessary journeys it's not about creating a village but a new idea of an urban district and lo and behold after this guy invented the theory what happened we had covid so for the last two years we've actually been most of us have been living the 15 minute city so the parks have been full, the cycle lanes have been full. So there's nobody on this Zoom call that's not in the same place they were two years ago. And we now have a different view on life. So, but Dublin being Dublin, we've, um, we've kind of uh, always lived a small, like we lived in Ratmines, we lived in Fisborough, and we had that, um, that 15 minute cycle. We went, we went to the local pool, we went to shops. But what happens? We had job sprawl where people all of a sudden decided that was cool to work in Leopardstown, it was cool to work in Ballycoolin, or you lived near Leopardstown, you drove, you drove over to Ballycoolin. And, and what happens when you get to work? You just you end up answering emails and I'm being on Zoom calls. So there's an awful lot of unnecessary, uh, all those people on the M50, a lot of the journeys are just totally unnecessary. So, so what works? But my experience from living the 15 minute uh, and lifestyle is, it's variety. You need everything in small. You need small industrial estates. And you really need parks. People will walk to a park with a kilometre away and they'll walk. And greenways, nobody cycles to a greenway. And nobody uh, drives to a greenway, excuse me, takes out the car and then continues on to the driveway. Everybody cycles to the greenway. And uh, so it's, it's all about what happens. And then, then you need buy-in. The county, has to be in, the county council has to talk to the shopping centres. The shopping centres have to be where it's happening. But sometimes you, when you meet people from the shopping centres, the management, they haven't got a clue. There's no feedback from the county council. So, uh, so boy, boy, and then, uh, and then more about yourself. What does it mean to the person who actually does it? Well, if you live a 15 minute lifestyle, you've got time to yourself. You, you can cook, you can garden, you become more grounded. And I mean, I've worked, I've lived the life. I worked in Sandyford for two years in Vodafone. I worked in, in Bald's Bridge, in some of the big financial centres. Spent 40 hours a week with people for two or three years. What happens when you move on to another job? I can, you never see them again. Well, if you live the 15 minute lifestyle, you're bumping into the same people all the time. You're building, you're building what I, would, I call sustainable friends. So um, people you'll know in another 20 years time. So. There is a lot to be said for it, but it's, and in some ways we've lived it in the last two years, but it's a huge goal that we all have to aim for in some way. Thank you. 
Martin, you said something there that I'm going to write down and steal. Sustainable friends. I love that. I absolutely love that phrase, sustainable friends. Because they're the fundamental needs of humanity, aren't they? Friends, people, society, they're what keeps us going. And we're also busy talking about sustainable energy and sustainable <sighs> lifestyles. But sustainable friends... You hit the nail on the head there. So I'm definitely going to steal that now when I'm, I'm going to be talking to Roshan Ingle on Wednesday about She's So Sustainable. And I'll be saying that's what we need because this, I was only talking to somebody last night about it, this 15 minute business, the idea that we're, we're, we're building industrial estates over here and housing estates over here. And then these guys have to get over here. It's, it's just all messed up. And if we want to do it right, we've got to do what you're saying there. Make sustainable friends. I love it. Stealing it. Thank you. Right, we move on to Anna Clara Fernandez from San Paulo, coming a long way and learn to cycle here in Ireland. I love that. Um, I'm no, and I know we all hear all the time we can't cycle in Ireland because the weather, which is total nonsense. So, Anna Clara, tell us about your experience and why you cycle. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I came from Sao Paulo. I lived in Dublin for five years. And back in Brazil, I never ride a bike. I learned it here. Uh, a friend came over to visit me. And then she said, my God, so many bikes here. And then I said, yeah, and I know I don't know how to, to ride a bike. And then she said she would teach me. So I have another friend who has a subscription for a Dublin bike. So I asked her her card, um, like I got a loan of her card and then we went to Monjoy Square and every 20 minutes we had to renew, like go and change bikes. But I learned it and it was really good. And then I started going from, from ho uh, home to work and school. Uh, cycling and that saved me a lot of time then I met my boyfriend and then we moved we moved it together to the Leary so he gave me a bike as a birthday present and it was the best thing ever so I cycle uh, 10 kilometers every day uh, each way so 20 kilometers every day and that's the best thing I did because it's a great way of like waking up in the morning, get me moving. And then it's also very relaxing and it's a great way of like decompressing, uh, coming back from work after a busy day. I really like, I prefer much more than taking the bus, the, the train, because it saves me time and it's relaxing and I can breathe the air. I don't know, I feel more, more freedom, you know? It's not as pleasant when it's like raining or windy, but I, but I still, I still enjoy, I still enjoy a lot, and yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's me. <laughs> Thanks very much, Anna Clara. I can't believe you said the complaint about the weather. That's that's shocking. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We've got Goldilocks climate here in Ireland. Not too hot, not too cold, not too wet. Yeah, too no, dry. it's really good. It's really it is. Good. <laughs> I tell everybody that. Thank you very much for sharing your experience, Anna. It's wonderful to hear from you. We've got K Clara Clark up next, Irish volunteer, founder of Cycling Without Age and prefers to cycle everywhere you can. Proving age is no barrier. Um, we've got the poor infrastructure to overcome, but certainly not. Age is not going to stop us. And uh, Clara, over to you. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, hi, everyone. Some of you, many of you may know about cycling without age, but in case you don't, and some of the panelists may not, the other panelists may not, cyclingwithoutage.ie. These are trishaws that you see in the picture. They're specially designed trishaw bicycles that hold two people and they have a battery to, for the extra power and they take people out for free, slow cycling spins. And when I brought the idea to Ireland in 2017, I wondered would anybody be interested or care or want to know and they did and four years later we now are on bike number 43 I think they're all around Ireland 
and they're mostly in care homes or they were up to now. But now we have a new um, element to it and it is the uh, councils, the local authorities are starting to buy trishaws and offer them to people in the community. So you don't have to be in a nursing home anymore to get a free ride. You can book them online. So Johnny, the, these are Dunleary bikes. They were the first two and they can be booked online at the bikehub.ie. Uh, I tra pilot train all the pilots. You have to be a trained pilot to use the trishaw. It's myself and my colleague Fiona here. Uh, Fingal have three trishaws and I was pilot training 10 more pilots out in Skerries yesterday and they're getting underway. And Dublin City Council have just bought five trishaws. And uh, I have, don't even know where they're going to use them or anything because we haven't got into discussions about that. Cycling for me is a form of transport, primarily. I love cycling. I have a car, I like to drive, but I hate driving, if you know what I mean. And as with all the traffic now, there's no pleasure anymore. Um, Cycling for me, I'm very passionate about because it's for all ages and abilities. And we take in our trishaws, there's a girl who's blind and her guide dog. We take kids with Down syndrome, with autism out. We take all kinds of people with all kinds of disabilities or just older age. The pilots get just as much fun out of our cycling as the passengers do. And the feedback has been tremendous. Um, for the residents in care homes, freedom and fun is what they say. If you ask them what do they like about getting out for a ride, freedom. They say, we get out of here. People with dementia are thriving on cycle rides. St. Joseph's in Shankill got one shot, then got a second. All their people have dementia. They have six homes there and um, they're getting tremendous value from the experience that the people with dementia have from riding on the trishaws. Um, my husband rides a trike, so I'm looking forward to hearing Sean talk later about his cycling, but my husband is 78 and a half and he's got Parkinson's. He lost his balance on a bike and he doesn't like walking. He's always loved cycling, but he now rides a trike with a little battery every day and he does 45 minutes every day on his trike. I also take him, we have a trishaw of our own because I use it for demo and for um, pilot training. And I take him now to hospital appointments, the dentist, the optician, um, hospital visits. And I take him as a passenger on the trishaw because it's a form of transport. Um, I spent 2020 because all our trishaws were basically cocooned along with the residents of the care homes. Um, campaigning with local authorities to remove kissing gates because kissing gates discriminate against people on trishaws, on trikes, on, in wheelchairs, and they discriminate against people of all ages and abilities. And so we have to get rid of kissing gates. And so there's now a campaign running nationally to, to do that. So I used the time that I couldn't promote cycling without age to try to get rid of the kissing gates. Also campaigning for off-road routes, safe off-road routes, because there's no joy or pleasure in taking a trishaw on a busy road or being stuck behind a truck or a bus. So getting off-road into a park or a greenway is just heaven. And sea routes, I mean, Scaries yesterday was heavenly going around by the sea. And of course we have the coastal mobility route here in Dublin. But I want these trishaws to be available everywhere around the country so anybody can get out and about. When you ride a trishaw with a passenger, you get the most amazing response from the public. They start smiling, they start waving, they start interacting instinctively. They don't do it consciously almost, but as you go by, people are saying, that's great, oh, I'd love one of those, will you collect me later? And you get this whole interaction as you're just going along the road. Like I'm taking my husband to the hospital, but I get all kinds of interaction. Um, the pilots are benefiting hugely. We have, all ages, from 19 to early 80s, we have pilots. And once they're trained, they can go. It's creating a social life, a feeling of participation, of inclusion, just for the pilots. They get chatting, they get telling their stories. Um, it's massively important. Um, and interestingly, I had uh, breast cancer three years ago, 
And I cycled in for all my chemo and all my radio treatments every time because it was interventions, 20 minutes door to door. I was guaranteed the time to get there. I had no parking problems. And when I came out of chemo, having had this cold cap on my head for five hours and drugs being pumped into me, I got on my bike and I put on my hat and I cycled down the Marion Road and it was freedom. It was, as, as Anna Clara said, it is that feeling, that lovely sensation of just moving and, and going along and feeling the air. So I'm really passionate, as you can probably gather, about cycling generally. But cycling at that age is extending cycling to literally all ages and abilities. So spread the word, it's cyclingwithoutage.ie, and there's loads of information there. So uh, so do, do get on to me, and uh, I can tell you more. So thank you. Thank you very much, Clara. I love that. I loved your... Um reference to your husband's age, that he's 78 and a half. Oh, that was super. And um, the pride in the work that you do there is very clear and evident and the joy that it brings you as well as the joy that you bring everybody else is very clear, very, very well presented there. Um, it was a great talk, I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Clara, thanks for your input. Thanks, Next Clara. up, we have Sean, a young man from Scaries. Scary's hitting the, the, the information here tonight again. And there he is on his trike. That's a great photo. These trikes are great. I built one for my own mother. She was always cycling, but her, her tinnitus knocked her balance off. Maybe uh, this is what we need to get her a, 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 a trike. And uh, I'm really interested to hear how you've been doing, Sean, because I just see you've got hit your 2,200 kilometer mark. That's pretty impressive, Sean. I'm going to let you tell the group and anybody watching all about what's gotten you to this point and how you're finding your cycling experience now. Why do you cycle, Sean? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I've kind of been cycling. i don't done a little bit of cycling since I was nine. That was when I got my first trike and then last March when the lockdown hit I I started cycling a lot more like in April and all through the summer and uh, that's when I clocked up a lot of kilometers and then I love cycling but I use a tricycle and like it's not powered by anything but push power by me and the reason I use a tricycle is because I'm a wheelchair user and I can't balance on a two wheel bike. And then there's lots of medical and mental benefits of cycling for me. Like I get to use my legs and there's like blood circulation and good for my bones and heart and other organs. And, and then, yeah, you, you feel good in yourself after you've gone out and you feel like you've achieved something. And then, and then my physio was saying that like that was the best physio that you could get anywhere. And then the more, like when I go out, I mostly do about 13 kilometers. And I'd say I go out about three times a week or four maybe. And the most I've done is 21 kilometers, I think. And then, uh, and then sometimes I go up some hills because if you want to leave Scaries, there's always a hill you have to go up because it's beside the sea. And then, and yeah, well, it's a great sense of freedom when you're out cycling. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, so my bike weighs 26 kilos at the moment and we had an event last week actually to raise money for a new bike for me and this one will weigh 14 kilos I think so it'll be way lighter and it will, I'd say, 
I'll be able to go bigger distances and faster speeds on this bike. But yeah, no, overall, I love cycling as a sport. Is there any questions? Sean, where do you go? When you go out 13 kilometers, do you do a loop around? Do you do a scenic loop or do you have a destination in mind? Yeah, no, mostly I'd go around Scaries. I just do a big loop of Scaries. Or then sometimes I'd go off. Or like me and my dad would go in the car somewhere and and cycle around that place where we stop off. Very good. Very good. And then that's how I kind of got into it from my dad because he always liked the cycling and racing. He does racing as well. Is that him talking in your other ear there behind the camera? Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> He's too shy. I, 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 yeah, no, I was on earlier on just to introduce myself to Siobhan, you know. So as Sean says, he loves the cycling, you know, and it's a great benefit from him. And uh, I know he touched on it as well from a medical point of view. And I know Clara mentioned earlier on, it's a yeah. great benefit. I know. And then you're getting from A to B, going back into the admission side of things. You're not born enough uh, anybody fuel except for your own. So it's, it is fantastic, you know, all around. Yep. It is fantastic. All, all round. I have fuel I burn off. It's called cake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but then you don't feel guilty having your cake and coffees then, you know. Have you, you can have your cake and eat it as well. Yes, yeah. Mm, and then actually, the just thing. just just ties into the, the, the poster presentation that the Clara was doing yesterday with Shauna already. You met the counsellor yesterday. Um, she's actually Sean's old teacher, so we know her well. And she, ah. she took part. She... When Sean was doing the cycling event there last week to, for this fundraiser, she obviously uh, gave the green light and dropped the flag for the guys and girls that were going off. And to, just to give you an instance, just to give you an instance, uh, there's the age group that took part in that event last week was, I say, the youngest was probably eight or nine. And then the oldest person was um, Sean. And another Sean, he's 80. Yeah. Now, Sean raced for years and he cycled a lot of Ross. And he, that day, he'd done 160K from Rahini out to Scaries and then the 100k loop and then home again but he got his coffee and cake during the, the event anyway so it wasn't too bad he a lot of cake for that number of miles yeah and then <laughs> I think uh, Sean O'Rooney I think she was doing the cycling without age thing yeah on Saturday Sean yeah Saturday I was sorry, sorry. pilot training her yeah oh, yeah she's yeah. lovely yeah, yeah no, she is. and she's going to be yeah. one of the pilots on the tri show out in Scaries, so you'll probably meet her out there. Oh, yeah, probably. Yeah, there. I don't know where I'll show you now. That's a. I saw your. I see. Can I show you now? Can you see? Uh, it's not great now. We show. you see it there? No, yes, no. she put that up on Twitter. So it's yeah. up on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah, that's Shana that. there. Yeah, and you yeah. guys as well. So yeah. That's fantastic, you know, and then, and so you know, scary. It's a it's a nice place to cycle. And then when Sean was cycling, I, I suppose the 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 COVID it did have some advantages when there was no cars on the road from mm. last March April. You felt real safe, and obviously with Sean's and uh, like we were saying earlier on, you don't be hold of traffic. But as you see, Sean's um the tricycle they're a bit wider than obviously the normal yeah. two wheeler. But uh, I know the the motors yeah. around here. They, they know that we cycle in that 10, 15k radius and they know us, you know, so... Uh, well, yeah, no. I think you could cycle for three kilometres and only one car would pass you. Yeah, last year. Very good. We're moving on. Yeah, thank you. Should we hear from someone else? We've got Una Morrison coming up next. Una was one of those drivers, Dro drove everywhere. And then a, a change of job made uh, cycling a better commuting option because it is most often actually is a better commuting option than um, driving, of course, within limits. I, my commute is 16 kilometers and it's still, people balk at the idea that you can do a commute of 16 kilometers. But once you get going, it's the same as five kilometers, just get used to it. So now a mum of three under five living in South Dublin and I can't imagine 
the life without the bikes and she's also on the Dublin Cycling Campaign Executive Committee and looking forward to hearing from you Una. Thanks Joanna um, and thanks everyone. So I'm Una there in the bottom of your screen. I realised when I was putting these slides together that I have hardly any pictures of me on a bike because I seem to be the one taking the pictures. But uh, as you see, I have three kids, two of them represented on the screen here. Um, and I started cycling when I moved jobs and I was working in the city centre and living in Sandy Mount with my now husband who you see appearing throughout. and. I was really nervous like I had cycled in a triathlon before but like I signed up for the triathlon without having a bike or being able to change gears so um I didn't really enjoy it um so I got a new bike and Roger took me through town and planned my route on a Sunday morning and showed me how to manage junctions and all of that kind of thing and then next thing we were on I was on the bike all the time fast forward to getting pregnant with Hazel who well, yeah, she's in all of them. Um, that's her who's on the bike on her own most. Of them. And uh, so I cycled when I was pregnant and then I switched to taking the bus, which was awful and, and walking. Um, and then when we had two kids, we realized that Roger could manage having a child on the back and the front, as you can see in the bottom, but that was just not practical for me. So we invested in an Urban Arrow electric cargo bike, um, which you can see, and it is the best thing we have ever bought for our family. Um, I find it incredibly comfortable to cycle. There's war over who gets to cycle it on family days out. Um, and it just means that we can explore the city in a really different way. You can see us in Grand Canal, that's taken during lockdown when there were two of us working and a three-year-old and a one-year-old at the time cycling around and uh, we could keep the kids entertained and away from people as well um, and get a bit of exercise while somebody worked at home quietly because the kids were out of the house. And on the bike, I don't really get to eat the cake, but the kids get to eat the cake because you can keep firing snacks at them in the cargo bike and they're happy as Larry. So we had a bit of a route of stopping at the Bretzel Bakery, stocking up on bread and flour and muffins and then cycling up and down the canal. But I think for us, the reason I've got involved in the campaign is because my girls really want to be able to cycle to school. Hazel is the junior infant who's in the cover picture um, of tonight's event. And she cycled on her first day to school, but it was hairy, you know, and uh, every time I'm coming to a cycling meeting, she's like, can you get me cycle lane so I can cycle on the road, mama, not on the footpath. Um, and it, it's something that we have been able to um, include our whole family. So you see my father-in-law there, he was uh, bringing Hazel to crash one day. He often used to bring Hazel to crash on the bike um, and he would just take Roger's bike and cycle in. Um, and he absolutely loves it and he loves that connection with the kids. And he did say yesterday when I was talking about this, he said it keeps them warm because you've got this nice little warm body in front of you and on a winter's day, it's great. Um, so we just really enjoy it as a family. And the fact that they can get to places like you can cycle into town, you can cycle to the playground in Stevens Green, you can get to so many places is much easier on the bike um, that we'd be lost without it and you can throw in a mighty amount of stuff into the front of that cargo bike um, every so often it needs a clear out. So um, now we have three so luckily the Urban Arrow will be able to take the baby. I'm busy testing him daily to see if he can sit up independently and then he's good to go in the front. He's not quite there but hopefully by Halloween. Um, so at the moment I'm using the car a little bit more, um, but we will be out as a family of five with three kids under five um, very, very soon on the bike and look out for us. And uh, if you're driving, stay away um, and keep us all safe. And uh, yeah, I don't be worried if people are considering about cycling with small children. It's a really incredible way to connect with them, to chat to them, to be able to stop and post a letter, to be able to, you know, stop and chat to neighbours and all that kind of thing. Like it's much more social than I ever anticipated. And it's really great for the kids in terms of wayfinding. Um, they know their way around our environment. 
because they've cycled and they, you know, they've been with me and they know, they know about traffic lights and everything, but they, they know our area really much, they see it in a very different way than they would from inside a car. Um, so I think that's a huge benefit because we all know that kids' cities have gotten smaller. Many years ago, my uncle, who's now touching 60, when he was four, he got a bus from Glasnevin into town, bought a pair of sandals and got a bus home again. Now, I can't imagine letting my five-year-old to do something like that, but it just shows how our cities have changed. And I I really want to make sure that our kids get um get the opportunity to explore our city a lot more. And I'm hoping that by being involved in this, that we can make a difference and reduce our emissions. We've done about 4,000 kilometers on the cargo bike. No idea on the other bikes, they don't have a tracker. Um, in, and that's, we have it about a year and a half. So that's me and I look forward to the chat later. Thanks so much, Una. That's wonderful. And um, I myself have three kids under 18. I don't think that sounds as impressive as three under five. But the thing about kids is they grow. And my kids have been, uh, they were all in that position, little Dutch babies. So they were obviously almost born on a bike, practically born on a bike. Um, and the great thing, like you say, is that independence that you give them when they're small grows with them when they're grown ups. Yeah. And my son now cycles eight kilometers to school. And the, the younger guy is itching to be allowed to cycle to school too. And he will be in another few months. He's still a little young yet to take the back roads. But that independence when they're leaving school at the end of the day and say, mom, I'm not coming home yet. I'm going to somewhere with my friends. Kids that get picked up from school don't get that. They don't have that. They don't get to not come home yet. They're going somewhere with their friends because their parents are waiting at the door of the school to, to whisk them home. They don't find their own way home. They don't look around and deal with situations. And that independence is an absolutely incredible, valuable resource that we give our growing children. Mm -hmm. I, th I think we've lost sight of that and the anxiety that our young adults are suffering from is uh, an indictment of that lack of independence that we've taken away from, that the independence we've taken away from our growing children. So Una, just thanks, thanks, Joanna. let them grow up on the bikes. That's uh -huh. my advice. Thank you. Yeah. And I, ju I just want to say one more thing, actually, before we finish. Um, some of you might have read in the news, um, a friend of mine passed away at the weekend in Gelfors, Carl Dempsey. He was a friend of Dublin Cycling Campaign um, and an avid cyclist. And he's one of the people that I knew who was doing mad commutes on his bike. Um, and I've known him for many years. So I just wanted to take a moment to remember him and all the work he did in kind of giving people like me a bit of confidence that it is possible. Um, so now I have a chance with a bit of an audience to remember him. Um, and we'll hand back to everyone else. Thanks, Una. RIP your friend there. Okay, so next we have um, a four-legged friend on a two-wheeled transport, Loxy Land, which is the best name ever, and his dog Zai, well known for cycling around Dublin. Uh, a chat. Okay, hiya. Yeah, obviously, I've been introduced as Loxy, um, why I cycle. Um, I've always cycled uh, from an early age. I, I have... I was racing in underage mountain biking. Uh, I was doing downhill cross country. Um, then I moved on to uh, road bike racing and progressed through that. I've also um, made my profession cycling uh, back as a cycle courier and done quite well from that when, when cycle couriering was, um, I would just say, uh, a more higher paid uh, than it is these days um but through my um so through my through my, my reasons for cycling have more or less changed now like i uh, think it was uh was a joan earlier on that said she had the injury like uh, i seen the um the screenshot of the x-ray with the plates i i had a bad accident in china uh, on a motorbike and i had my leg rebuilt and i got like similar sort of x-rays to joan so Right now, I wouldn't be at the same proficiency um, physically as I was back in the day. So now my my cycling is more out of necessity. And 
I'm going to um actually say uh the necessity is our little four-legged friend here. Um he it doesn't matter how many times I walk him in the park uh, every day, if he doesn't get his um his bike ride, he becomes obnoxious for probably a week after. He loves being up on my shoulders, he loves being able to see everything. He loves being a seven foot tall Westie. Uh, not many people believe me when I tell them I have a Westie that stands at seven feet. So I have to bring him out every day. Even Some days I don't want to leave the house and I just see him, he looks at the bike and then he stares at me and then he looks at the bike and every day at half five, six o'clock, uh, we go through the same routine. So I had to throw him up in the bike to bring him to a park more or less in town. Um, I actually, another thing to, just that crossed my mind, I think it was Anna uh, from South America, I can't remember which country. Um, she said when the weather in Ireland, and I just want to give uh, Anna a little bit of advice. Um, when you're cycling in Ireland, it's like going for dinner in the Shelburne Hotel. You have to dress for the occasion. So if it's winter, you have to have your you, you have to have your waterproofs and your your warms. And in the summer, we can all go get our suntan. So oops, sorry, <laughs> this is my first ever Zoom meeting. <laughs> you know, so 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 sorry. Sorry, just one second there. Uh, my electronics went a bit a bit crazy. So. Myself and Zoe, we have become a kind of well-known characters around Dublin. I never trained him how to go on the bike, but he just didn't like being left home alone. So, uh, oh, don't, don't, sorry, 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 sorry. So, um, so he, he, um, he figured out, he figured out one day if he, when I was leaving him home, it's like if you get in the bike, go on the bike, and I progressed from there, and now it's all history, and I don't know. I regret getting the dog. <laughs> Sorry, I don't, but I have to. <laughs> I have to. I, I can't praise him. I have to just, um, how would you say? He, I'm a big, burly man. If you look at my muscles, you know, they, you know so like, I can't admit that I, um, I have affection for a small, uh, white, fluffy, four legged creature. So I have to keep my. I, I have to keep my, uh, my, my big, burly image. <laughs> Thank you. Is that okay? That was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your, your big bully image intact there. I oh, have a, right. a little white furry fluffy dog and I oh, know exactly yeah, but... what you mean by those looks at the end of the day when she hasn't gotten her prescribed whatever day. She has a, a little park here. At the end of the day, we go out off the lead. She's always on the lead when she's out, but at the end of the day, she goes out off the lead and she'll sit and wait with her head cocked like she has a watch, time to go. But that's that. That was a lovely, um, lovely little insight there, Loxie. Thanks very much for sharing, and thanks for introducing your dog, our favourite friends. Thank you. Gwen, yeah, Gwen Alwyn, owner of the Company of Books, an award-winning independent bookshop. Beautiful frontage there. Trading in Ranelagh since uh, two thousand and nine. And we're looking forward to hearing why Gwen cycles. Uh, thank you, Joanna. Um, so, yes, I own the company of books and we are an independent bookshop. We're primarily a community based bookshop and most of our customers live in the locality. Uh, in terms of why I cycle, I would pretty much say up until March of 2020, I was purely a recreational cyclist. My bike is a Futura Sintero. So nothing fancy. I've had it about six years. It's a plain old pedal powered bike, just like Sean. I'm 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 pushing away on on the bike using uh, leg power. Uh, the thing about my bike is it's got a very nice black and pink paint job. So uh, that's 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 the attractive factor of of the bike. Um, and as COVID hit last year, I began to notice people were becoming nervous and reluctant to go out. So I decided to put a notice up in our shop and on our social media, offering free local delivery to those who needed it. Um, we also started to redesign our website to move it from an old fashioned kind of this is who we are website to a fully transactional e-commerce site. 
And when the first lockdown was announced uh, at the end of March 2020, bookshops were classed by the government as non-essential retail. So we had to close with immediate effect. We were kind of unable to do anything uh, until after Easter, when we were allowed to operate as a delivery only service, um, but in the same kind of within the same 2K travel restrictions as all of you. And initially we started out on foot carrying bags of books and really this proved impractical and uncomfortable as trust me, books become heavier the longer you walk with them. So my black and pink Sintero came to the rescue along with my partner, Catherine, who would bring her bike down to the shop and help me do deliveries in the evenings. And my lockdown routine quickly became eat, sleep, pack and cycle. And I have to say, um, it was a joy to do delivery by bike, particularly in the first lockdown. Uh, it was so much more practical to, del to deliver by bike than by car. There was very little traffic on the roads. And if you remember, the weather was beautiful. I'm, I'm sure, Joanna, you have notes on that somewhere. Uh, you could hear birdsong everywhere. Uh, you'd see loads of families out on bikes enjoying cycling around the city suburbs and around the canal. And one memorable sight I have was of a family cycling across the N11 uh, from big to small, like a row of ducks kind of on bikes. Um, and if you know the N11, it's usually a really, really busy road and you'd never see that. Uh, anyway, in, in, in my cycle rounds, I became familiar with every lane and shortcut in the neighborhood. And our cycling delivery grew uh, by word of mouth, really. Um, most books ordered were delivered either the same day or the next day. And people were kind of excited by that. Um, I called it our bookaroo service uh, on social media. So I would hashtag some posts with hashtag bookaroo. And we began to receive some media attention via Ryan Tuberty on radio. And also Connor Pope listed us as one of the best bookshops in Ireland, which was amazing considering the big names we were up against and how new we were to online retail. But who knew really that the greatest challenge would come kind of with lockdown three after Christmas, uh, when we were kind of obliged, well, we weren't kind of, we had to do delivery and delivery only for five months. And it was really, really tough. Um, so by this stage, we had kind of refined our delivery process. Um, when we started, like I would pack, back, pack bags of books for delivery. I'd hang them from the handlebars, fasten them to the back carrier, carry them in a rucksack on my back. And this was okay once the weather was good and traffic was light. But as traffic increased and the weather worsened, it became obvious that I should invest in panniers. And particularly so when you think about books being different sizes. I don't know if any of you know Joanna Donnelly's book about the weather. It's called The Great Irish Weather Book. Uh, that is a really big book. So if you put that in a regular bag and try and cycle with it, it's, it's, it's a recipe for disaster. So much safer in a pannier. Um, we also made then changes from packing books in bags to parceling them in brown paper so that we could fit them more easily in the panniers. And believe me, I was like a new woman with, with the panniers. The bike was much more stable. It was much easier to cycle and particularly going uphill. Uh, I also learned the importance of good windproof uh, gloves in the winter to stop my hands freezing on the handlebars. And Catherine gave me a very fancy bike helmet with flashing lights, kind of pink night rider, except for a bicycle helmet uh, and a Bluetooth connection as well for Christmas. So you could kind of hear Google map directions uh, in, 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 your, in your ears while you're cycling. So all in all, it's, it's been a really unusual year. I kind of learned that as a small business, we've been able to survive a very, very tough situation. Thanks to all the people who decided to shop local. And I'd also go so far to say that cycling saved my business during the pandemic. Earlier this year, we were thrilled to be voted one of the top three independent bookshops on the island of Ireland by the British and Irish Book Awards. And I think this is in no small part down to our bookaroo service. We've continued to offer a delivery service. And personally, I'd love to see more business consider delivering by bike where possible. I think actually there, there could be something underway with uh, Dublin City Council looking maybe to sponsor some cargo bikes uh, for businesses, which, which sounds really, really interesting. Anyway, um, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to take part this evening, and I hope that might have been interesting to hear.
gosh, that was incredibly interesting, Gwen. And I'm not just saying that because you saw my book. Uh, that was really, really wonderful to hear and actually quite emotive. Um, your, you've overcome adversity there in the face of, I, I can't imagine the challenges that your personal business, that, I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's yours that you've built and then for it to come under so much pressure and then for you to find your way out, it's really a motive story. And yeah. uh, I'm really grateful that you shared it with us. Thank you very, very much. Um, and I've really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed listening to your story. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll give you a hint on, on, I wear gloves all year round on my bicycle to protect my hands because the wind will cut your skin even when it's uh, not a cold wind. So I wear like cotton gloves in the summer and in the winter, the best thing you're going to ever invest in is a pair of mittens. Um, I have a pair of sheepskin um, lined mittens that keep my hands toasty, not too hot, not too cold, just toasty. And they're really handy for whipping off really quickly. So I would always advise people to cycle with mittens. <laughs> um, thank you again. And next up, we have Satanta Myler, a Dublin teenager Hi. with a hot take on cycling. Cycling is great, you're right, Satanta, it is. Take it away. Hi, uh, as Joanna said, my name is Satanta Myler, and I am a Dublin teenager who cycles to school every day. Uh, it's not as, you know, the commute isn't as epic as some of the, you know, the, the journeys we've seen, but uh, I'm here to express my opinions on why cycling is in fact great. Uh, so, I mean, I must start out by saying that, well, well, that every morning I get up, I eat my breakfast, or I get dressed, I eat my breakfast, I go out uh, and I cycle to school, and cycling school is, you know, it, it's different from, you know, recreational, uh, because we have all of the luggage, and we also have the fact that it's very early in the morning. Uh, now, the reason it is so much better than just sitting down in a car and going to school without all the effort is because, well, firstly, it's incredible exercise. And secondly, in, that, in those kind of uh, peaceful 15 to 20 minutes before school, I get to really kind of be, get calm and collected. I really prepare myself for the day. And, I, you know, it's, it's very... It's very nice, and it's, I think I wouldn't really give up that kind of advantage for the world. Now, aside from school, or, well, still in the boundaries of school, when I'm coming home from school, because I'm not being picked up, as, you know, some points were uh, said earlier, because I'm not being picked up, and um, because my friends aren't being picked up, they're going home their own way as well. We can really kind of make plans. We can make last minute plans, maybe go down to the centre, down the road, or maybe just hang around the area before going home. There's not really much kind of, there's not really much schedule to restrict the, the very flexible kind of hours. But, um, it, it gives us a lot of independence and it's a really, it's a massive benefit to cycling. Now I do have a friend who does get picked up, but that's because his, uh, his house is absolutely miles away. And, you know, he's a big family in school, but it's kind of, you know, he's a very good friend of mine. And we kind of hate to see that he can't do all these, you know, recreational, you know, light recreations after school with us. Um, and aside from that, you know, it is, it's great exercises, I, I already mentioned, and uh, as I, and it's a really efficient way to get to school um, with the panniers. I remember before I, I had, you know, I had invested in panniers, like, you know, on a back carrier and all that, that just clips on, you can take it off. And I remember the cycle of the commute, though still being better than driving, being pretty dismal. You know, um, when it's on your back, you know, gravity just feels so much more there. Uh, so 
all in all, there's definitely a, a mental, physical and social benefit to cycling. And that is why cycling is great. Thank you. What a wise young man. Well done, Stanton. It's great to hear that you are enjoying your independence. That's what you deserve. You deserve to have your independence and you deserve to be respected and safe on the roads so that you can grow into an adult that will look after us when we're all old, please. Thank you very much. And thanks for your input there. It was really, really good to hear from you. Well, fair play to you. Um, last, and I hope not least, I'm sure not least, Kira Tooch, and I hope to goodness I've gotten that right, a member of the D12 Bike Bus Network, and would be delighted, Kira, if you'll take away there. Great, thanks Joanna, well done on the pronunciation. <laughs> Yeah, so like Joanna said, my name is Kira Tooch and I'm living in Walkinstown with my husband and our five kids. Our kids range from ages 10 down to two. And we got involved with cycling through their school, Riverview Educate Together, as a group of parents in the school set up the D12 Bike Bus Network. So the bike bus goes on a Friday where a group of experienced cyclists uh, volunteer their time to cycle with parents and children to school, uh, giving them extra support on the roads. And one of the reasons my family got involved with the bike bus was purely because I got sick and tired of lugging five kids in and out of the car and all of the fun that brings, the car seats, fighting over who's sitting where and what music we're listening to and that whole palaver. So um, we exchange it for cycling at least on a Friday and sometimes we get another couple of mornings in. But when we did get cycling, we quickly realized what we were missing. You know, cycling, as you all know, cycling offers great freedom and there's a great sense of community. And studies have actually shown that rhythmic activities such as cycling not only improve physical health, but also mental health. Um, as the rhythm regulates the brain, this is really important for our children in particular, um, because that regulating of the brain prevents cognitive decline, which boosts their chemicals in the brain, which then supports better learning and memory. And our principal of the school actually has mentioned that she has noticed a difference in the children arriving by bike to school, that they are fresh and focused and ready for learning, um, as opposed to, you know, just hopping into the car and grumpily going. But um, in the slideshow that you will see now in a few minutes, there's a large number of families that avail of the bike bus on Fridays as it gives them security and safety. And actually my description of, of the D12 bike bus is it's like a comfort blanket on wheels for me and my family. But unfortunately you don't see that number of families cycling Monday to Thursday as they just don't feel as safe on the roads. And that's why the network was set up purposely to ensure safety in numbers. So we're providing the children with the opportunity to cycle and we're allowing them to experience the freedom that it gives. And like it's been touched on, we're preparing them for the future and um, giving them that independence where they can just hop on a bike and just get to where they're going um, on their own two wheels. So while my family, we really enjoy cycling as part of the bike bus and we love the camaraderie and it makes you so happy first thing in the morning. However, we are really looking forward to when Dublin 12's temporary infrastructures that have been put into place, when they, they evolve into like simple working permanent infrastructures. And it makes so many local um, cyclists very happy to see this. And also it'll give others who don't currently cycle the opportunity to think about doing that, changing their lifestyle. They could be like my family and not yet have realized the love of cycling in your local area, doing your day-to-day -day things. I love the idea of the 15 minute commute for everything. It's amazing. So there's so many people, I'm sure they just haven't even realized that they have that love for cycling in them. They just need to be given the opportunity with the infrastructure. So our hope is now in three to four years when our eldest child is cycling to secondary school, that Dublin 12's permanent cycling infrastructures are in place and that they'll be her comfort blanket on wheels. And so she can go independently herself. 
But uh, so that's why we got involved in cycling and that's our story. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Kira. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, I think I must be in um, time to hand back over to Siobhan at this point. Um, I'm not sure. I did and really enjoy hearing everybody's um, talk. It's such a diverse group and everybody coming from a, a different angle, but with so much to bring. And e any one of your stories is a reason for everybody to cycle. And here you are, so diverse across all ages, abilities, stages in life. Um, and we all think that the stage of life that we're in at that time is the only stage of life, but of course it's not. We all evolve and our families grow and they leave us and then they come back. And it's cycling, per it permeates through all those eight stages of life, as we see. And hopefully keeps us all fit and happy and healthy. Some way we last doing it. Siobhan, am I handing back? Yes, thanks. Thanks very much, Joanna. And um, just to wrap up, um, before we finish, I'd just like to remind everybody, uh, you probably do all know um, that there are amazing bike week activities happening in Dublin um, and also all around the country. Um, so definitely check them out. Uh, uh, for example, there's a Leitrim Cycling Festival this weekend, um, which looks fantastic. Or there's also Navin Bike Festival, for example. Um, if you check out the cyclist.ie homepage, there's a nice roundup there of, um, of activities that are going on across the country. And um, Kira um, gave us a, a video to include, which I would really like to share, but I won't play the whole thing because I know we're gone over time. But I'll just play a little few seconds of it here now to wrap up. And um, I think you'll all really enjoy it. So I, I'll say again thanks a million to everybody who took part uh, to Joanna and all the 10 speakers who were all just fantastic and really inspiring um, and thanks for everybody uh, who um, thanks to everybody who put in questions and comments in the chat there and um, we'll do our, our usual routine and um, when meetings used to happen in real life in the central hotel and um, after the meeting uh, the people would um, move on then for a drink in the library bar. We have to keep that virtual, but everybody, if anybody wants to stay on the call um, and have a bit of a more informal chat um, after uh, we stop recording, you're very welcome. If you just stay on, um, I'll make you into panellists and you can join uh, the chat. I know probably some of our panellists have to go, um, but obviously if you want to stay around uh, for the bit of chat, you're all very welcome to do that. So I'll just play a few seconds now of our D12 bike bus video. Um, to put a smile on your face as uh, as we wrap up the evening. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Okay, I hope that gives you a, a flavour of it anyway. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll stop recording now. Thanks again to everybody. And if you want to stay around for the chat, just stay on the, on the call. That's okay. Bye now.